Welcome to episode three of HyperChange Breaking News, your stories from the future. We're starting off today with Neuralink, Elon Musk company that plans to put a chip into people's brains and allow them to control different types of technology. Uh, this has huge potential as potentially what's next after the smartphone and Apple's Vision Pro. Well, the chips keep getting closer and closer to our brains. Uh, Neuralink was just such a crazy ambitious project when it was founded a few years ago, and now they have achieved uh, potentially one of the most important milestones in company history, in technology history, in science history, in human history maybe, um, by in actually installing it into a patient successfully. It's not just monkeys anymore. They've literally put this into a human and it is working. He is healthy. Um, he's controlling a computer with his thoughts. Uh, this was, and I just, this is hot off the press. I just watched the live stream. Very, very moving. Um, and just a kind of an incredible moment here. Still a little bit starstruck and awestruck by what we saw. Yeah, I mean, this patient really is a, a pioneer for trying the Neuralink for the very first time. He's a paraplegic, which means he can't move from his shoulders down and is now able to control a screen, uh, a mouse on the screen to play chess, to control music, all with just his brain and really just unlocks a lot more opportunity for him as a person to be able to navigate the digital world with just his thoughts. Uh, it's just really, really exciting on what this means for patients. And Elon Musk's crazy vision of Neuralink has seemed a lot more tangible recently. You know, the symbiosis between humanity and AI with Neuralink, what does that really mean? Well, for me personally, that's really hit home a lot with seeing these chat GPT, Grok open source or AI models where you're prompting, you know, you're a prompt architect. Those are the people who are controlling the future. And there's so much going into typing to control what the AI, to sort of merge what you want the AI to do with its powers. And so when you think about Neuralink, I, it really kind of hit me of like, wow. This is would make it so much easier to talk and interact with something like OpenAI if I had, you know, essentially a mouse or interface that could just connect through my brain. So uh, the the flow of information is just so so much higher potential. So uh, really exciting stuff. Also, Elon Musk is killing it with just huge huge news. This is not what's happening inside our brains, but it's happening in outer space. Uh, SpaceX's Starship rocket with its third test launch. Um, and it did not get enough love in the media for how epic and successful this was, reaching orbit for the first time. Um, one step closer on the journey to Mars here, SpaceX doing these launches for us all to see in public. Fans from across the world gathered at Starbase uh, to go see this launch. Uh, super exciting moment. I wish I could have been there, but I saw some, some stories on Instagram. It looked epic. Aiden, what's the scoop on uh, what this means for SpaceX and the details on this rocket? I mean, it's hard to appreciate just by staring at this picture of Starship and how it's going to fundamentally change humanity. I mean, this is the rocket that's going to get us to the moon and Mars and just around the solar system. And we are watching in real time. It just develop the test flights after test flights to train the rocket and get better and develop the engineering. And this was his third test flight. Like you said, the first two test flights uh, didn't make it to orbit. So this was a massive milestone. This is the largest rocket that humanity has ever built. So it's just truly epic of like biblical proportions of humanity kind of becoming interplanetary. And this is costing SpaceX five to $10 billion in capital to develop this and tons of engineers working down in Boca Chica, Texas to develop this. And so now we get to witness it take off and be a part of that journey. And it's just so exciting. I think one of the most interesting points is that this, the first time it took off was in March of last year. Then there were seven months and it took off again. And there was five months and it took off again. And now we're hearing that another Starship launch is just six weeks away. And so this pace of that SpaceX is innovating and their ability to produce these rockets, send them to orbit. I mean, this is how we get it to the moon. Like we need speed. We need to be able to produce these rockets quickly. And SpaceX is showing that that's possible and that the FAA is kind of lowering their regulations, uh, or not lowering, but they're approving a batch of Starship launches, not now approving one launch at a time, which was slowing things down. They're saying, look, we approve a handful of Starship launches, go for it. So I think we're about to see a flurry of SpaceX to sending things to space uh, with Starship. Such a bright day for, for America's innovation and feeling like the dawn of a new space age here. Uh, I know that's got us both fired up. And in other, another Elon Musk uh, news from one of his companies here, Tesla's full self-driving software getting a huge and extremely highly anticipated 
update FSD version 12.3 rewrite of the code. Um, I personally just got this version of my car in Seattle, had a uh, incredible zero intervention drive down the urban streets. Uh, very impressive. It's very rare to even have an intervention in downtown Seattle now, which is a huge change for when I got it a few years ago. And we've been seeing uh, all sorts of feedback here in the Tesla community. This is why I think this is notable because there's a lot of Tesla FSD updates. It, it's constantly getting better, talk, constantly talking about that. But we have had some critics, some skeptics across the technology spectrum saying how much of a game changer this is. Chuck Cook with the infamous left turn saying this is a step change in vehicular autonomy. Rob Mauer, our homie from Tesla Daily, always giving very measured takes on Tesla, saying he was extremely impressive driving this through downtown Chicago on St. Paddy's Day. So incredible reviews all around even michael dell said he was super impressed um but this is just you know I, it feels like tesla stock is down um it, you know in the, the sentiment feels like we may be farther than ever from tesla achieving a full self-driving car when in reality is they are make, getting closer than ever and i just feel like there's not enough focus um, on how much progress has been made here other than just inside the tesla community one thing that's interesting to note here is the software architecture is fundamentally different than versions that have come prior. Previously, things were hard coded, and now Tesla 12.3 is using neural net, so it's behaving more like a brain, kind of learning on the fly. And uh, I think that it just shows us that the all the breakthroughs that are happening with chips and AI are starting to help the full self driving movement. And the question is, when do we get that Chat GPT moment? For Tesla FSD, um, where the world kind of freaks out and says, oh my God, AI is here. It's eating a huge chunk of the world. Um, it feels like we're getting closer and closer than ever. Um, and I, I feel like I'm living it every time I drive my car. And speaking of self-driving cars, I mean, it's not just happening at Tesla. Waymo just expanded to LA. This is their third city after San Francisco and Phoenix. It's now covering 63 square miles, as you can see with this graphic here. And this was previously in a trial run where they did about 15,000 rides and people got to play with it for free. But now it's going to be open to their 50,000 person wait list. People can now pay and use Waymo. So this is just incredibly exciting for the self-driving car movement that we're starting to see multiple competitors, people using it in their day-to-day -day lives. I think for a lot of people, if you didn't own a Tesla, if you weren't in one of those cities, you've never experienced self-driving. But now as more and more people kind of start to use it, it's going to start to hit people that this is real and it's happening. And it's such a big step change. You and me will probably always remember that first ride we took in the Waymo uh, in San Francisco a few months ago, truly self-driving car, the robots talking to you. You don't have to do anything. It feels like a kickback in the car. Uh, so exciting. And I think the big takeaway from that was, you know, is it Tesla versus Waymo? Is it Cruise versus Tesla? Is it, you know, who's, who's winning this battle? And, you know, I really t t took away from that, that really it's everyone, it's the traditional legacy automakers versus the technology companies. Um, it's the people who rely on human drivers and then the cars that don't. Tesla and Waymo, I think, are both winning, totally different strategies, but are both showing us this future that is coming faster than we can even imagine. It's taken so long, but now it's just happening all at once, it seems. Um, this is, you know, also Waymo's plan to expand to Austin soon. So they're rolling this out incrementally, step by step. And before we know it, we'll be taking self-driving cars around everywhere. So, um, I think the biggest concern and and sort of thing to watch here is what is the move for legacy car makers? Are they gonna they're gonna have to partner with Waymo or Tesla or totally get left in the dust? And where does that leave companies like Uber? You know, as they think about a future that's post self driving, that there's all these cars on the road that drive themselves, is the hard part to have the network of drivers and riders, or is really the hard part to have the self driving cars and that they can build the Uber interface pretty easily in just a few months of development. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting to see how Uber plays into this, but we saw this image of Uber showing that you want to get into public transportation potentially, um, or they didn't say it directly, but Jason commented on it as an Uber insider and made a winky face. So maybe there's something going on there, but un unclear. I thought this was super cool though. Just the idea of Uber tackling public transport, a private company that does so well at ride sharing. That's been such a game changer for getting around our cities. Um, working with, I just saw this little cute tram on X and I was like, wow, this is, I wish this was around our city and I wish it was integrated with the Uber app and, uh, just a refreshing kind of dose of positivity and potential here. But, but I agree with what you're saying, the self-driving elephant in the room. I mean, that's gotta, the, the people even bring that up in the Uber board meetings. I mean, it's gotta be a little awkward, right? Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone knows it's existential to their business, right? So it's like, and they, and they tried self-driving 
and they had to shut that program down. So it's kind of like they know they may not be able to really do it. Does Waymo need them? Yeah, they're definitely going to be in a precarious place. Very interesting to see how this will all unfold. Grok, OpenAI, the battle heats up. Grok has actually come through on its promise to open source. Its algorithm weights in bio is the lingo they're dropping on X here. Uh, this, this happened much faster than I anticipated. So major props uh, for Grok here. Yeah, I just can't believe how much Elon is doing between Neuralink, SpaceX, Tesla, open sourcing Grok. Just, I just cannot believe how much Elon companies are releasing. But this this model is super interesting. It's one of the, it's bigger than Facebook's Llama model, bigger than Mistral's model. It's open source, and now anyone can go to GitHub uh, and use the, the the parameters that they spent lots of GPU power to basically develop. And now anyone can use it to build something, which is really exciting. And moving into other AI news, Microsoft uh, hires the Inflection AI team. Um, this was interesting for a couple reasons. Notably, you know, Microsoft keeps making big moves in AI. Clearly, that's a big priority for Satya um, and them, you know, having the synergies there with being able to run the compute on, on you know, Azure, their cloud services for AIs seems like their big play here. So they're trying to get a foothold. And what I thought was interesting here is it's kind of like an aqua hire. You know, there's been a lot of antitrust issues with Microsoft. Are they coming up with some new strategy here where they can aqua hire founders and get them to work for Microsoft without really making a true acquisition, getting around regulatory scrutiny? Um, that could open a lot of crazy doors. But um, what's what's your take on this one, Aiden? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. They're getting around some antitrust things, but it's really unfortunate because if I was an investor in Inflection AI, now the founding team leaves to Microsoft, it feels like you're kind of holding the bag here. And Reid Hoffman says big things are ahead. They hired a new CEO and tries to make an optimistic spin on it. But uh, I just don't know how you really recover from this. Maybe now that the founders are at Microsoft, they continue to work closely with Inflection AI and help with that partnership from the inside. But I'm definitely, I'd definitely be worried when after the company just two years ago has raised over $1.5 billion in funding, now the founders leave. Where is this company headed? Uh, it's, it's super unclear. And maybe they got worried with all the competition out there with OpenAI, Grok, and Anthropic. And in other AI news, the NVIDIA red hot momentum continues with their unveiling of the new chip in this incredibly sci-fi Black Mirror-esque scene of all these humanoid robots on stage uh, with Jensen, the CEO and founder of NVIDIA. Um, clearly, they are getting ready for this massive AI tidal wave that is upon us. Um, and everyone's talking about who's going to disrupt NVIDIA, how long can this run last? But it looks like NVIDIA may have disrupted itself. What's the scoop on this new chip that they unveiled? Yeah, re NVIDIA really did kind of disrupt themselves with this chip here. It's 30 times faster than the previous version. It uses one-fourth the amount of energy. And it's really designed for the generative AI movement to be used across, you know, cars, these robots that we see on the screen here, a lot of other applications. And all of the industry leaders in cloud servers use NVIDIA chips and kind of praised it as the gold standard. So it really, it really doesn't seem like there's going to be any competition here, at least for the time being. And this said uh, from Jensen that this took five to ten billion dollars of R&D work to create. So that's going to be a lot of money that's going to need to be poured in to various startups or competitors to even get close to competing with NVIDIA. In the other maybe AI, you know, not so hot company buckets, we've got Apple. Apple rumoring to be teaming up with Google's Gemini. Um, you know, everyone's been speculating what's Apple's AI move. They have the device that everybody uses. They're in an incredible position to, I mean, Siri sucks, but do something. Uh, and everyone's been curious what that's going to be. Google's AI Gemini with a big flop recently, getting a lot of uh, heat in the press. And now it's like, well, their team, they might be teaming up, which I think could be looked at as two ways. Is this a move of a strength? where Apple's hardware combined with Google's AI is just an unbeatable tour de force that could dethrone OpenAI and just throw a wrench in this whole AI ecosystem? Or is this a last ditch effort by two losers in the AI industry to try and scrap and get something out there? Um, I think it's TBD, but really interesting. Apple and Google, not friends usually. So this really unique to see them potentially teaming up. With that said, though, Google is the default browser on Apple Safari, so they have kind of partnered some uh, in the past, but I, I think this really just goes to show you the training de uh, data being so important for the AI revolution, and Apple doesn't really seem to have an internal AI strategy if they're already thinking to work with Google, and this seems to be kind of the really only opportunity 
Um, unless they partner with another open AI, I know they're in talks there as well to figure out how they're going to incorporate AI into their hardware products. More chip news. Intel getting some big guap from the government, $8.5 billion uh, as part of the CHIPS Act here. Um, wow, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, and it also could come with $11 billion in loan and tax credit. This is expected to create over 10,000 Intel jobs, 20,000 construction jobs, create four new chip fabs here in the United States. This is incredibly exciting as the need to bring chips onshore is really important for geopolitical reasons. But look, I'm just not sure if Intel is going to be the ones to be able to pull this off. Um, I'm excited about some new chip companies and startups, um, but certainly a lot of funding is going here. Uh, Intel has relationships with the government, kind of the long stalwart of Silicon Valley. So we'll see what they're able to do with this funding. And it's interesting, you know, I want to piggyback on that because NVIDIA is not, or Intel, sorry, isn't someone I associate with, you know, big disruption, executing well. Um, it seems kind of like an old company that's probably lobbying, and that's a big reason they've gotten this. That's the sort of devil's advocate, uh, skept conspiracy theorist in me. Um, but, you know, they bought Mobileye for a mass amount. That was a self-driving chip company out of Israel. Massive potential there. You know, that's turned into a huge nothing burger. So we've seen Intel fumble the bag on some of these bigger projects uh, in recent years. Curious how this one will go. Yeah, and maybe Intel can take some of that funding and fund uh, some other startups that can actually do the work. <laughs> Uh, more government guap printing news here, $2.26 billion for Lithium Americas, uh, a company that has an under billion dollar market capitalization here to develop the lithium supply chain in America. Yeah, they just got this massive loan out of uh, to work on mining lithium out of Thacker Pass. This is the largest known lithium deposit in the United States. It's expected to create 40,000 tons of lithium grade uh, battery material. Uh, and then by 2027 is when they expect production to begin. So this is a massive loan. This is bringing lithium back to the United States. It's a, really, really exciting. But will this be on time? Is this going to go over budget? Is this the right company to really execute on bringing lithium back? Uh, time will tell. But they certainly they got the loan, and uh, we'll see how this construction project develops. But clearly what's happening is the Biden administration is using a lot of capital to kind of fuel critical industries to bring manufacturing back in America. Yeah, and this trend has resulted, um, you know, at a high level in a lot of money printing in the U.S. system. You know, we're taking a new approach of uh, using a lot of public funding, um, taxpayer dollars to fund sort of these these high level strategic projects. And, you know, what has that resulted in? Uh, inflation. We've seen a huge amount of inflation uh, since COVID times. Uh, this stat here, 23, 24% inflation. Um, if you compound it since January 2020 uh, for the world's leading currency, I mean, this is pretty significant um, and goes to show you why you really need to be investing and protecting your savings. They say this might even be a conservative amount and that it could be even much greater than this. So it's just crazy to think that Basically, we've lost almost one-fourth of our purchasing power in just four years. And that wraps up this week's episode of Hyperchange Breaking News, Stories from the Future. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you all next week.